All right. Good morning. Uh, this is the Ethereum uh, Practice Podcast, and I'm welcoming Carly Stigler, Stephen mm-hmm. Weber, and Tom Whitford to the group. And our topic today is connected collaboration. So, the last this is our third podcast, um, and the whole purpose is to um, the whole purpose is to uh, just talk about a few articles that I've summarized and um, kind of tie it in together, but kind of bring your knowledge into the into the mix and be smarter. So I always start. Um, we'll start with you, Tom. You want to tell a little bit about yourself, where you're at, what you're eating? Where I'm at, what I'm eating? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> uh, where I'm at. I'm uh, Tom Woodford. I'm an elementary principal in Wisconsin. Uh, I've been in the administration gig for a while now, and um, I uh, let's see. I've been in Wisconsin here for I'm trying to think seven, eight years now. Um, but I'm born and raised in Wisconsin. Left for a little while, and I found my way back. And uh, I'm glad to connect with the great folks here on this chat today. Cool. And what are you reading what right I'm now? Eating, Tom? Just a little water for breakfast today is what I'm eating. What I'm reading? That's a whole other story. <laughs> Is that what you wanted, Matt? What I'm reading? Sure. Sure. I tell you, besides the great articles that you gave us to reflect on, uh, I've been reading Choice Words here. It's one that our administrative team mm-hmm. had to read together. Yeah. And uh, a little book chat on that, Choice Words by Peter H. Johnson. And uh, awesome. that was actually it was a really good book. I, I like it also because it's, it's thin. Yeah. Uh, administrators like that thin books. Administrators like thin books. Uh, so we've been having some good chats about that one in our uh, admin team meetings. But the other one that I've really started to get into um, is Unmistakable Impact by Jim Knight. Wisconsin mm-hmm. moves forward with the educator effectiveness, um, the new evaluation system here. I really like Jim Knight's focus on the instructional coaching aspect of things and having those evaluations more as a, a coaching model. Uh, so that's been a really good one, too. Um, but the one that Stephen turned me on to um, that I've been listening to in my car is uh, Good Leaders Ask Great Questions by John Maxwell. That's been a great, great listen to every morning on my commute. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. You bet. Uh, Steven, tell us a little about Good morning, yourself. everyone. Good morning. My name's Stephen Weber, and I'm currently the Executive Director of Curriculum Instruction with Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And I'm currently reading a book titled Learning Personalized. One of the authors is Allison Zamuda with the UBD cadre. And she has two co-authors with this new book. But I think this is dynamic, whether you're a K-12 teacher, a principal, assistant principal. Um, I work in the central office. It's great for me and my work with teachers and leaders. But this is a brand new book, hot off the press, and I'm loving it. Is that... um She's she works with Grant Wiggins, isn't she, Stephen? That's correct. Okay, so does it do like uh, it kind of describe how to develop units of study and things like that, or it goes in depth. It's it's not really a theory book. It goes in depth on what personalized learning would look like. It's it's kind of the buzzword right now in education, but a lot of people don't know what does it look like. So it goes in depth on what it looks like, and it gives examples from every level, K to twelve. Very cool. And Carly. Hi. I am in Fond du Lac right now, third, fourth, fifth multi-age mentor teacher at STEM Academy. Um, and right now I am actually reading a uh, John Maxwell book, Thanks to Stephen. It's one of the smaller books. It's called How Successful People Think. I left that one at school, but I'm in the middle of that. And um, it's really great. just is broken up by chapters and just like different aspects of thinking, so like reflection and processing and big picture thinking and having goals and um, large goals and small goals. And I like, there's a lot of great parts and I like to share it with my students, so I keep that one at school. Um, But I just started this one, which I'm super excited about. It's called Nomad Society. And um, I actually have only gotten to the foreword so far, but it's already great. And the back of it sounds fantastic. And um, really, I think from what I have so far, it's just getting at the picture that like, really we live in a world of abundance so what does that mean for us just as learners in general and how does that kind of affect in the classroom so I think it'll 
um, as I was reading, it kind of made me think of one of the articles that we were going to be discussing today. So I'm that, excited. Who's the author for that? Um, it is John W. Moravec. Yeah. M mm -hmm. O N A V E C. He's got a good TED talk, I think, and he kind of sums up that whole thing, concept on online. Very cool. So yes. is that brand? Is that a brand new book? Um, I think so. I'm pretty sure. I think the copyright is 2015. So. Oh wow. I think it's newer. I could be wrong though. It was one of those random finds from Amazon where they say. If you like this book, you'd probably also be interested in those books, and that's how I keep buying, buying, and buying oh. more books. So, yes. Amazon. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, for, like, doubling my to-read list. Those all sound awesome. Um, what I'm reading right now um, is a um, – what I'm trying to get into, I'm kind of where Carly's at. I um, uh, Looking at this book, I'm sure a few of you have read it or heard of it. Yeah, I love uh, it. Awesome. Good. Good book. I don't. I don't the know. Best yet. books I've ever read. <laughs> yeah, I've heard it's excellent. So, oh, Tom's got it with them right now. Oh yeah, you've got a few tabs in there too. Wow, very well read. So, um, read it yeah, twice. I'm I'm where Carly's at. I've read like the back and the front. <laughs> so. It's a pretty easy read, Matt. You'll like that book a lot. Okay. Uh, assistant principal uh, from high school. Like Grade level teams are dysfunctional, so it comes in handy because every school or every school district you work in has a dysfunctional meeting or a dysfunctional team, so it's very handy. We're all human beings and we're all imperfect, so you will come across a meeting that's dysfunctional, and that book is very, very handy. Yeah, it, yeah, it's it's it's, it's on the top of my to read pile, so I'm I'm excited to get into it. Um, the first topic. And this is about collaboration, connected collaboration. And the first one I thought was very interesting. Uh, Dick Costello uh, says it's okay to never tweet. Uh, it's from the New York Times Magazine. He's the CEO of Twitter. And he says that um, everyone wants to know us to have to do what's happening in the world, be connected and know what's going on. That's what Twitter provides. So I think that it's irrespective of, what, of, of whether you want to tweet, everyone get value of Twitter right away. So... Do you agree with the CEO of Twitter that you never have to tweet? Yeah, I, I'll jump in real quick, Matt. Uh, I, I, I agree that he's talking about kind of uh, it's okay to be a lurker on there, and I think there is a point to that. Um, it, it's how I got started, too. When I first jumped on Twitter, I wasn't, I don't know if I wasn't confident or just wasn't even really sure how it all worked. When I first joined Twitter, I think I did like everybody and followed Charlie Sheen and Ashton Kutcher and Alyssa Milano. And, um, you know, I got bored with that pretty quick. But then uh, I went to a, a conference, and I, I believe it was Steve Dembo came up and was speaking there, and, and he was sharing about how he had used it. And uh, I was like, okay, I'm going to give this another shot. And uh, when I first got on and connected with some folks, again, I, just, I don't know if it was just confidence or I didn't know what to share. Um, but I eventually got to a point where I, I jumped into some conversations, uh, uh, replied to some people's thoughts that they had shared, and, and I became confident in using it. Um, so, I, I mean, I think the lurker stage is something that a lot of folks go through when they first get on, and uh, you can still learn from that, but I, I think it becomes stronger when you participate. Would you I, would, I agree with Tom. I think you have to kind of know what your purpose is for it. Um, I know when I got on, like, a, my, a lot of my friends, like Tom, like, following celebrities, and that wasn't interesting to me. So, like, I kept going on and trying, like, this is stupid, there's no purpose. And a lot of my professors back when I was in college were saying, you know, you should try Twitter. It's a great way to connect with other educators. And can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay. All right. Sorry. This very delayed, so I wasn't sure. Um, so they were saying it was a great way to connect with other educators, and I tried a couple times, and when I was student teaching, um, one of the student teachers, or the cooperating teachers I was working with, talked about Twitter chats, and then that's kind of how I got started, and then really the power of all of the information and resources that are shared, and all the connections that you can make. Um, I think Twitter is probably really one of the only places that can really allow um, us educators to do that, and then cross like, such a broad spectrum. Mm -hmm. 
What do you think, Steve? I don't think you have to be on Twitter to be a great educator. There are plenty of ways through Google Docs and social media and live binders. There are other ways to be connected than Twitter. But it's hard for, I think, anybody in this chat this morning to say we're not better educators because of Twitter and Twitter chats. And so Twitter has made me a better educator over the past four years. All four of us met through all things PLC, a Thursday night Twitter chat, and that's how we all met. Then it evolved into a Voxer group that we're all four, four a part of, and now this morning a Google Hangout. So you can see how this has evolved for the four of us on this panel this morning. But to say that you you know can be a great teacher and not be on Twitter, I, I think that's possible. I do think it makes you better though if you're part of a, some sort of a connected learner, connected educator community. Well, as an administrator, I just it's great for me. It it, it takes that it takes away that isolation and. Uh, um, you know, it's a it's a very isolating job in administration and even in teaching too. And so, you know, I totally agree with you, Stephen. It, uh, it's broadened my horizons and gave me perspective. And uh, you know, something comes up, it's like, oh, that's normal. I mean, it happens somewhere else. So, well, and the thing that I take away from it too is, uh, it, like you said, Stephen, we we all uh, got involved because of a Thursday night Twitter chat for all things PLCs. And so, to me. This a little bit comes back to professional learning communities, and the whole idea of PLCs is breaking down those walls that we have within our schools too, and uh, trying to get folks together and collaborate. And that's what Twitter does, except it takes it beyond your walls now. So I mean, obviously you could use it within district and things like that as well, but uh, you have the opportunity now to connect with outside those four walls of your building, um, or even your district boundaries, and connect with people all over the place, and it's still expand that learning, that experience piece, that sharing going on, and be able to bring some new ideas back. Um, and so to me, that's what uh, the, the PLN or the PLC is a great start, but it really starts to blossom when you develop the PLN, the next level of PLCs. And uh, so, I, I mean, I think that's a beautiful thing, but jumping back to what Dick is talking about here in his, in his article or his response, um, he's saying it's great for folks, because trust me, he wants folks on Twitter, mm -hmm. um, it's great for folks to be on Twitter, but they don't have to share. And uh, again, I'll agree that uh, it's good to be on Twitter and at least you're collecting some resources and things like that. But I think the real powerful part of the learning comes when you start to interact and share too. Um, it's great to get resources from everybody else, but I think it takes it to another depth of knowledge and, and I think you also gain experience by involving yourself in the chat too. So, mm -hmm. I mean, why you don't have to, I would encourage people to do it, and to me a lot of it becomes, it's that natural phase for folks to lurk first and then get involved. And I think in uh, this book they talk about the different stages of um, being involved, and they talk first lurking and then, and then responding and then you know, developing relationships, and so it's kind of a natural progression, kind of what you all are talking about. So. Yeah. Matt, I think what's hard for people, and this was my story, is when you jump on Sat Chat on Saturday morning, there are 100 people from superintendents to first year teachers to principals to central office people. There may be even some authors on there who are big names that you've read their books. And you're a little bit nervous to jump in there and throw a question out or throw a resource out because you don't feel like maybe what you have is up to what they have to offer because they're big names to you. But the reality is it's a, it's a family or a community, and once you join, everybody's pretty open arms. So I think you just got to jump in the deep end rather than trying to, you know, dog paddle in the shallow end. Yeah. You got it. It's the saying, ready, ready, fire, aim. That's what one of the teachers told me for Twitter chat. She's like, that was the first time she joined. She never had any clue, didn't know the A1, Q1, or any of that, or, like, what her – purpose what really like how to do it but she just was like my philosophy is ready fire aim mm -hmm. and luckily someone was kind enough to say hey like this is kind of how it works and mm -hmm. helped her out and then she taught me and the cycle has continued so awesome. um, sometimes you just gotta take a risk. Have, I think you have to have a bit of courage to jump in and do it, especially sad chat I mean you're talking Steven said a hundred but they have over 400 participants on some Saturday mornings and and if you're just staring at your Twitter feed trying to keep up with that that can be incredibly mm -hmm. overwhelming. So uh, to a newbie, that probably wouldn't be the first chat I recommend that they no. try to learn on. Um, but uh, you can learn a lot, and yeah, that a chat like that can be kind of overwhelming. To and a it's, it's really early in the morning, too. 
<laughs> yeah, yes. that's, that's why I like to join the Sat Chat West Coast. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, we have one viewer on our uh, show right now. So, and I tweeted it out. So, there you go. Oh, right. uh, we're Matt, growing. We're Matt, growing. Could I have one more resource? Yeah, please. Um, there's an app that I like, and I refer educators in our district to called Tweach Me. The Tweach Me app costs 99 cents in the app store, but it, it allows you to see what is a Twitter chat, what is a hashtag. There are YouTube videos, there are links to um, all of the different Twitter chats, but it's just a real quick and easy way to organize. Here's my interest in education. Where's a chat that I could go to? And it also helps you learn to navigate the chats. As Carly was saying, some of the things about Q1A1, it's all in there and it's easy to follow for a newbie. How do you spell that, Stephen? T W E E C H M E. Tweet me. Okay. Cool. Susan Beard and Craig. Anything while we're in there? Uh oh. What's wrong? It's going in and out. Okay. We can hear you. Okay. All right. Well, my it's going in and out. Anyways, if you want to learn how to facilitate a Twitter chat, you can just hit up at Curriculum Blog because he's really fantastic <laughs> with that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yes. We're going to go to the next article. Um, this one's a long one. I was in uh, Barnes & Noble one time, and I just picked up a Harvard Business Review uh, journal, I think, for January, February. It was excellent. I mean, they're just every article is really good. I mean, it's long, um, but I just found a lot of connections with what we do as teacher leaders and uh, administrators. Um, but it's the art of giving and receiving advice. So kind of similar to what Tom's reading right now with the Jim Knight book, uh, Mistake Will Impact, and and coaching, but very interesting that I like this quote: uh, "When you pick your advisors, you pick your advice." And um, coaching is really about um, trying to get out of the way and kind of being on the side when you're working with someone uh, that needs help. Uh, you're like the driving instructor when you provide oversight and guidance. Your ultimate goal is to empower the seeker to act independently. Uh, I'm not going to read through the whole. Um, summary here, it was a long one, it was hard to summarize, but one of the main points was that um, mindsets are generally different when you're working with someone in a coaching um, or PLC environment that um, the advisee is looking as a um, more of a seeker um, and the person that, I'm just reading here, I apologize. So, yeah, you know, when we make when we make um, we give feedback to someone, um, we don't want to tell them what to do, but at the same time, we want them towards you know an end goal. Um, you know, why is it such a challenging skill to master? I think it's challenging because often in education we try to fix people instead of help them or coach them. Yeah, and that's really what I've liked from from Jim Knight's book, and actually he came up and did a, a workshop at a, at a local education agency for us recently, too. Um, just the, the difference between trying to teach the teacher and maybe help facilitate the teacher's learning. You know, if, if you can move yourself into that mode of being that guide on the side and really kind of asking them questions that will help them reflect more on their practices and and help them understand what aspects they need to improve yet. I think I think you can do a lot more for the teacher in that way, and I think they're more accepting and open to the learning than too when it's them kind of driving their learning instead of you saying, here's what you need to do, or here's what I would do. And uh, what, what I liked about the article you shared too, Matt, was that it really, it, when, you, when you choose someone to be your mentor, your advisor, you're really picking to say, hey, that's who I want to follow and be like, because they're going to give you their their thoughts and their their wisdom and their experiences on it, and yours might be totally different, and your your um, setting may be totally different than theirs, and so it's it's not always applicable, and so that's what I like again about PLN and connecting all those folks on Twitter and Voxer and things like that is you're able to take their feedback and their experiences from all over the place and say, okay, what's going to work for me instead of just focusing in on that one person. To be your coach, you can have a variety of coaches there too. 
Yeah, yeah. I agree with Tom. We're in a Voxer group, and in our Voxer group, we um, often will throw out a question in the morning and a question in the afternoon as we're driving to and from work. And when we throw out a question, we get advice from superintendents, principals, teachers. So for me, in a K-12 job, I get multiple perspectives. I've got an issue I'm trying to figure out, or I've got a topic that I'm trying to research. Somebody else has already read the book, or someone else has already led that professional development. So I'm getting resources from principals. Someone's saying, I tried ed camp in my school faculty meeting. Here's how it worked. And I'm getting ideas so I can have a bigger impact on teaching and learning in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, much bigger than if I were just sitting in my desk trying to figure it out on my own. So the Boxer Group, to me, has become the place where I go to get kind of mentoring, even though I've never met these people face-to-face. -face. Yeah, this is the first time I've ever met you, Stephen, or Carly, um, beyond just your profile image, you know. <laughs> but I've, I've learned from both of you, though, too, so that's a good point. I want to hear Carly's thought on this, though, too, because I'm, she's more in that role of being uh, the yeah. advisee and uh, what's your perspective on, as a teacher, how would you prefer that your, your principal, your curriculum director, whoever it may be, coming to, to coach you, how would you prefer that method uh, be like? Um, so I think about the advisors that I've had and have and the difference of like me, because I always like to try to be on the front end and really seek out advice and share with others and reflect like this is what I notice is going well or not going well um, and the difference I've gotten is people like you said Tom who question you and help you kind of make progress through bringing out what you're experiencing through questions versus people who are telling you like this is what you should do or this is what I think you should do it's a very completely different um, approach and then like me personally I respond very differently to that and like I prefer people who reflect with me through questioning and because then it really helps focus on the situation and helps me think about um, what I can do to really make progress and I think like the questions they ask um, are really important and just because they're only asking questions and not necessarily giving advice they're still giving like I think their advice and their perspective through the questions that they ask and the way they ask questions and another thing like I like the article I talked about um, I think one of you already mentioned it like you're seeking out your advisor I and I like what I got from the article is that there it was you kind of only getting one perspective but mm -hmm. I think like it's really important to be the person seeking out your advisor and if you have the awareness of knowing like this is my perspective this is their perspective and then mm -hmm. you can kind of filter it accordingly I think the awareness is a key piece so that way you're not only getting like one-minded advice like you're you're understanding where that's coming from and then the idea that you don't just only need one advisor you could have multiple advisors which is where the PLCs and the PLN comes into place. Yeah, that's a really good point, Carly. I always try to put myself in that person's position and what does this person need right now? Sometimes they need, you know, tell them how to do it, you know. Maybe it's just a skill that they just, you know, whatever, but sometimes you're right. A lot of times it's, you know, just asking questions and trying not to fix it for them, but, but I catch myself doing that a lot. So I think coaching and just uh, collaborating just Steven said it's it's a messy thing before, and it's you just need to constantly attend to it and constantly sharpen your saw, and uh, it's just a skill you're just going to work on your whole life. Because I find myself often reverting back to just telling someone how to do it, and I know that's not the best way. And that's and that's how come I've started to read Steve, uh, not Steve Jim Knight's books as well. Um, I find myself often wanting to. Um, tell them how I would do it or what I've read and this is what I would do and uh, you know really if I want to be in the coaching aspect I, there are some teachers that often just want you to tell them what it was that I should do and uh, my problem with that is I'd be recreating a whole bunch of me's in the classroom and I don't know if that's the best thing or not I know I believe in what I believe and although those beliefs have altered over time as I learn and grow um, I don't know if I want just a whole bunch of me's in each classroom and so what I what I'm trying to get myself to do more and I would like my teachers to embrace a little bit more uh, is uh, I, I can be that guide on the side and ask those questions to help them reflect and sometimes you just follow it up with another question um, but but I want them to step in there and say okay what's gonna be best for me I, I've 
I've learned about all these different ways and things like that, but what's going to work best for me in my classroom? Because that's unique in every room uh, and to every teacher. So really, I think that's where I, I try to get them into that mode of, okay, I need to be the reflective person here. I need the one to be to take action. And I also need to be comfortable with the fact that some of the things I'm going to try are going to fail, and that is not a bad thing. You know, they, they have to be able to embrace the fact that we all make mistakes and we learn from those and get better. Um, but so that's hard for some folks, especially in this age of accountability we have going on. Right. And time. Yep. I think Stephen's got some great ideas for some books he can write. Uh, lead with questions and don't fix people. I think that's... <laughs> um, i got to tell you, this is what I love about having Carly in our group every day because it, she... She brings a perspective to all, almost all the rest of the folks in our group are administrators, uh, either uh, in a curriculum role, coaching role, or, or some kind of district level leadership. Uh, we have Carly, a brand new teacher, come in, and she shares perspectives that that Stephen and I every day are like, God damn, <laughs> she blows us away sometimes with the questions she has and the perspective that she has. And the only thing I have, the only other thing I know too is. The things that she shares that she learned in her uh, teacher prep program blow me away because 90% of the candidates I get have never heard some of the stuff that she talks about and shares with us. And I'm like, I'm going to have to start funneling teachers up to that school because they're teaching some great stuff wherever she went. Where did you go to school, Carly? Carroll University in Waukesha. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great people there. Good professors. But thank you, Tom. I really appreciate that. Um, I have to admit, being um, it's so interesting listening to the boxes um, that you guys share since everyone kind of is administrators. I feel like I'm kind of getting the inside scoop on like what kind of is like your role and what are you thinking and like how as a teacher should I be thinking and improving and um, do acting. So it's, it's so super helpful. Awesome. So thank you all as well. Do you see yourself currently going into administration ever? Not at all. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> we, we um, other no 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 other I think other forms of education I'm not sure what but like principalship or like superintendent not for me but other forms possibly. Mm -hmm. We have a teaching job for in Chapel Hill right now that we're saving but she likes the snow. <laughs> oh, stupid. <laughs> I'll admit I'm a kind of a slacker in the boxer group lately. I've just been uh, uh, just haven't been doing it, but uh, I do enjoy listening when I can, and it's uh, I agree, it's just a lot of smart thinking in that group. So here's the last article. Uh, I'm sick of smart goals by Dan Callahan on his blog. Uh, I love the title. Um, he's just he calls it evaluation theater when we set these goals and we see if we met them and. And then we decide if it is or not. And uh, he believes that most teachers go through the motions in this area. Um, it's the timelines are arbitrary. The objectives are less than inspiring. And he just is quoted as saying, "Teaching is the work of years." And I don't think I figured it all out yet, but I know I'm not very interested in playing it safe. So, thoughts on that? Do you view smart goals in the same light as Dan, um, or are you somewhere in the middle, or do you, do you love smart goals? Then? Mm, well, I'll jump in. I completely agree with him. I think that we're thinking about the purpose of education for now and kind of getting at the idea that where people are talking about the 21st century learning, but that I, like kids in school right now are going to be working in the 22nd century. So what does that look like? And it kind of really reminded me of Will Richardson's TED Talk on, like, we live in a world of abundance, so the classic idea of kids coming to school to get information from one person, like, knowledge is not limited anymore, so what does that mean for teaching and learning, and I think that it's very ambiguous, and we are really thinking about habits and dispositions that allow kids to be curious and seek out those resources that are continually available to them, and that's not necessarily something that can be structured and measured and always attainable, but just like he's saying, just because it's not necessarily immediately attainable doesn't mean it's not something you should strive for. And I think that after reading this, like the SMART goals lend itself to like conformity and ambiguity, which 
but then when we say we want students to have autonomy and be independent and um, create and so like we say we want these things but the structures we have in place don't allow for these things that we want to happen so I certainly um, agree with everything he's saying I think we're all big fans of professional learning communities and Rick and Becky DeFore's work. We've all been influenced by their work. It's kind of how we all came together was through all things PLC chat. Um, I agree with what Dan's saying, but I also think there are plenty of schools around the United States and Canada that have gone from being an average school or low-performing school to a high-performing school because of SMART goals. So to just throw SMART goals out and say they're worthless I think would be bad. I liked in the comments underneath Dan's article, um, I liked what Bill Ferreter wrote and I liked what Matt Renwick wrote. Um, so I would encourage people to read those two comments underneath the article for additional perspectives. Um, teachers and administrators have different views on goals, but I think if you're having a third grade PLC meeting and you end the meeting and you don't have any kind of a goal, then you just met and all you have is you know notes from your meeting. You need to know planning forward, we are here where are we going? The students are here. How are we going to get them to where we want to get them at the end of the year or at the end of the nine weeks? So I think you have to have goals. You know, without a goal, you're just kind of out there floating around and you end up at the end of the year still floating around. And we can't do that to other people's children who trust us with their kids. But if it's just something to do because the superintendent said we're all going to do SMART goals this year and we're sitting around spending more time trying to create the R or the T in the SMART goal, then we are actually in, impacting student achievement, then I could see where teachers would think it is kind of pointless. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, it was interesting. I wanted Carly to go first because I wanted to hear her perspective on it um, as a new teacher because SMART goals in Wisconsin and some other states I know too, uh, SMART goals in Wisconsin have now become um, a part of your evaluation piece because we've moved into this student learning objective piece and uh, or student learning outcomes. and. Uh, Smart goals have turned into this uh, evaluation tool, and they didn't used to be that. It, it used to be part of our PLCs. They used to say, okay, what is it that we're trying to do uh, and improve in our students' learning? And uh, it drove some great conversations, and it, I think it helped teachers take some actions, some purposeful actions of what do I need to do in my classroom to help my students get from here to here in this area. Um, and, and I think that was good. Uh, it, it definitely, I think, uh, opened some teachers' eyes to what are some uh, intentional steps I can take to help student growth. And uh, to me, that's what SMART goals were all about when they started. Now they've become politicized and they're part of this accountability measure and things like that. And so uh, I, I think smart people have been turned off to SMART goals recently. Um, to me, again, I understand Dan's point of uh, we want to try to promote innovation, creativity in our classroom. Some of those things are hard to measure, and some of those things come with a lot of failure. And so do we make people accountable with SMART goals through that? Or uh, do we say, do we still use that SMART goal method, that framework, and uh, say, how, how can we grow still with SMART goals, but not become the focus of, well, whatever I do, I, I can't not meet my goal. Uh, and that's the problem with the accountability measures that we've taken and applied to SMART goals now. Yeah. Well, and that's that. And I agree, Tom. It's and Carly. Carly, are you in the DPI model for effective educator? What? Are you in the effect? Are you in the DPI model for the effective educator? Or are you doing a CESA six? CESA six. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the, what we struggle with too. Is um, you know, because you're evaluated on if you met your SMART goal or not, and so. There's probably a tendency to lowball it and just make sure you can attain it and maybe not strive as much as you want to to go for. One thing we did in our school to try to help is, um, I'm going to hold it up, I don't know how well it will show up, but uh, create a driving question. It's almost kind of making it into action research and then have some different questions on the side and then we talked about what can I do to support you with artifacts and you know walkthroughs and whatever to... Um, to help you attain that goal, but we also made it so there's multiple measures to determine that SMART goal, so it's not just um, pre and post assessment and writing. There's also a portfolio that the teachers can look at. We actually had a kid who 
last year blew off the end of the year assessment, just had a rough end of the year, but the teacher could go back in the port the, in their digital portfolio writing and so you know what the kid did do it. And so I think that's one thing with smart goals is I think we need to be smart about having more than one piece of data to show that you know, we met it. And that's the problem with the accountability measure piece that we've added to our smart goals now is you have to focus on this one thing so it's easy to identify if you've made your goal or not and we've applied this whole rubric to it that shouldn't be a part of smart goals um, and, and SLOs technically aren't smart goals like the old framework it's just they use that format and it's some accountability tool um, but I agree Matt you know there's again what what are we trying to measure are we, are we really just focusing in on uh, oral reading fluency because it's an easy one to measure and it's easy to say oh if they read fluently then they're a good reader and so they've made their goal that, that that's ridiculous and that shouldn't be what our, our our teachers goal is as a whole is improving their ORF score or their maze score or their star reading score or whatever it may be that's that's ridiculous stuff there's so much more going on in the classroom than that one silly test tool but because of accountability measures, that's what we knocked it down to, and it's made smart goals look like a terrible thing. And I think goals are extremely important. And here he talks about aspirational goals. So maybe those are big picture goals, and then learning kind of how to break your big picture goal down into smaller goals. I think that is extremely important. But I also think that it's all about who is deciding. I know in Braille, or uh, Richard Gerber's book, Change, he talks about the power of purpose of goals and how they kind of need to be unimposed from external external forces and not that you're not receiving help on your goals but you are the one deciding on your goal and kind of thinking about how that goal is going to help you experience growth from where you've started and it's like with SMART goals I think that there's a lot of external forces on the the goal itself and I think that and also, like, I really think about, like, student input on these goals, and like, it's for the students, but yet they have no input on this. So I think it's just really interesting, like, how these SMART goals are playing out. That's a good point, you know. When we didn't include any of our kids in our goal setting. I think that that's something we should be looking at. We still do goal setting with our students, but I don't know that it actually becomes part of our SMART goal. Um, but we... we well, in a previous district that I was in, and the current district I'm in too, we do set goals with our students on their learning. We, you know, we benchmark them at the beginning of the year, and then we say, okay, where is it that you want to get to? What do you think you need to do to get there? And those are some very powerful conversations and things like that. But again, they become focused on just one test score kind of thing. And what about the other goals for the student? And that's where are we not personalizing this experience enough? Uh, because we're too focused on all the accountability. Well, um, good conversation. Um, you guys rock. And uh, thank you for taking time to come with me today and, and chat about this. This is good stuff. And uh, I'm sure I'll be coming back to it to, to listen to it again and uh, learn from you some, learn from you for, uh, some more. So... Um, any closing thoughts? I'm just happy as heck that I finally got to chat with Carly live. <laughs> so uh, this person that I talk with almost daily on Voxer, uh, like I said, you wouldn't believe uh, Mr. Weaver there. That guy is incredibly smart and wise. Uh, but the things that I learned from this new teacher uh, just blow me away every day. So... Thank you for allowing me to connect with her uh, sort of face-to-face -face today. Tom, you're talking me up way too much here. This is, this is not accurate at all. <laughs> I, I'm doing whatever I can to schmooze you into my next di district. You know, if I have an opening, I'm calling you. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm so excited I finally got to meet all of you guys. You're all celebrities to me, so this is awesome. <laughs> It's fun. Thank you. And Matt, this is such a great, fantastic idea. So thank you. Yeah. And I just want to say thank you to Matt for hosting and inviting each of us to be on the chat today. It was a lot of fun. And I wish we could do this more often with this group. So maybe we could do it in other formats with Google Hangout, a little different than a Twitter chat. And basically, 
each of you make me a better educator. There's a lot of good things going on right now in Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools. And I get credit for some of those things, but I get a lot of ideas from my PLN. So thank you for making me a better leader. Mm -hmm. well, thank you all. Um, I'm on spring break. So I'm out of here. Oh, nice. I'm not going anywhere. But. <laughs> uh, mine doesn't start till Friday next week. Oh. Well, yep, mine great... as well. Oh, okay. Well, everyone have a good break uh, whenever it is for you, and uh, have a good weekend, and that's a wrap. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.